Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the service today, and we're on the countdown towards Christmas. Oh my goodness. Uh, we have had up behind in the announcements that uh, we have uh, two more weeks today and next Sunday for our series on Joseph, Meant for Good, and then we're going to move into our Advent uh, series, and so we will start that. Uh, first Sunday of Advent this year is in December, and so that will be our first Sunday, and on that note, we do always decorating as a church the Wednesday night before the first Sunday of Advent, so this year it is on Wednesday, November the 29th. And we do an after Bible study, and we get the kids involved as well, and we have a time of refreshments. And Pastor Mike usually puts on a few little Christmas songs for us, so get us in the Christmas spirit, if you need help with that. And so that is Wednesday, November 29th at 7.30. Uh, ladies Craft Night, I'm assuming, Lori, have you got the sample out? And the sign up? Okay, perfect. So there is a sample out, ladies, you'll have to wait till the end of the service to see the sample of what we're going to be working on. And uh, we ask you to sign up. You've got this Sunday and next to sign up. And feel free to invite others because it is an outreach. And our desire is to draw others in. Now, some of the men want to make it too. Amen to it. Invite some men to come along. We'll let you do that. Uh, but uh, we want you to sign up so that we can properly prepare and make sure there's enough materials for everyone. Uh, there's no cost to it. We just ask you to come. Now, next Sunday night, not this Sunday night, next Sunday night we'll have our third discipleship gathering. We've been enjoying that together, and so we will have our third next Sunday night meeting for coffee at 6.30. And what do I bring? Cheese and crackers. And we invite others to bring something along if they want to. We don't really need a whole lot at 6.30 at night on a Sunday night. Uh, and so we've been having a good time of fellowship and discipleship. The discipleship uh, gathering starts at 7 p.m., so that's next Sunday evening. We have put in uh, about the Christmas hampers again. We keep knocking and asking if you know of someone who you would think that they need a special blessing this year, uh, receiving a hamper for Christmas dinner. Our hampers are specifically for Christmas dinner. Um, we ask you to nominate uh, discreetly, confidentially into the office uh, with Carol. Just a reminder, this is a blessing. This is not necessarily only for those seen as in need. We do it as a church as a way of encouragement, uh, a way of welcoming, and there's different ways that we do it. So pray about that, and if there's someone that you, the Holy Spirit, puts on your heart to nominate, uh, recommend to the office, we encourage you to do that. Uh, Daryl this year is going to be looking for a team. Daryl Ashley, we've got the two Daryls. Daryl Ashley will be looking for a team to help pack. Uh, we're going to get involved this year. We're going to pack the hampers instead of just purchasing them. And then, of course, as we've said, Daryl Wallace is the team, and, and uh, he's the deliverer. He's uh, Santa's helper. He puts on the hat that day and goes, and, and uh, it's quite a ministry. We've heard such good report in years past of this ministry that the church does at Christmas time. Uh, this Thursday night, our seniors are gathering here for a games night and uh, fellowship. Uh, notice the time change. We've had it sometimes at 7, but it's been moved up to 6.30. And so uh, encourage the seniors to come out. Who's seniors? 55 and older. And I found out a few times, even if you're younger than 55, they'll adopt you. So you can be a senior for the night. Anybody want to be a senior for the night? And we're not getting too many takes on that anymore. <laughs> so games night on Thursday at 6.30, and you can bring a snack to share. I did put on the messenger group this morning that we're about 15 signatures behind the 50 that we need for the uh, Bill S210, and that is out. The letter is there on the bulletin board, and it's got to do with proper notification uh, in media about pornography and to protect children and youth. So we invite you to, if you haven't signed that last week, we would like to get that off this week uh, to our MP. And so we're praying that you would sign that and that we can get at least the 50 signatures, if not more, and send that off. Pastor Mike also wants to remind you that 
this week, and I want to remind you as well, that on our Wednesday night Bible study, we are reading and studying 2 Thessalonians. So we ask you to read that letter, to the second letter to uh, the Thessalonians to be ready for our discussion on Wednesday night. Would you stand to your feet for a call to worship? Are you awake? Yep. Look to somebody and welcome them this morning.
God before the Lord. Hide your face through the carpet. Call upon him. Pour out your spirits, laments, complaints, and your praises to the Lord God. He hears it all and he understands each and every one of us.
are holy. You are righteous, Lord. We bow before you, O Lord. We come to the one who commands the winds and the waves and the storms of every era to be still. And when he speaks into those situations, they are still. Lord, we come and we ask for God that you would forgive us as a church. When the pandemic came, Lord, it should have broken the church to the knees. But I didn't. Then wars began to happen, O Lord, in Europe. And we still haven't come to that corporate prayer meeting. And now there's been Israel and Gaza Strip and Middle East conflicts, so Lord. And still, Lord, we're not coming corporately before you. Would you forgive us, Lord? Would you forgive us? We definitely don't have that picture of day and night, night and day, that ancients arise to the throne of God. Lord, make us a praying people. I know we pray in our homes, but make us a people who pray together in one place. Lord, calling on the name of God. Believe in the name of God. And when he said, be still to the economic crisis, it will be still. We said, be still to the political crisis, it will be still. When he says, be still to the war in the Middle East, it will be still. Be still to the war in the Ukraine and Russia, and it will be still. Be still to the ones that are suffering from addiction to the Lord, and they will be still. Oh, God, have mercy on your church. Have mercy on your church. Help us, oh God. Help us to be the people you called us to be. You are our Father. You want your will to be on earth as it is in heaven. You want your kingdom to break into our worship service. You want us to feel and sense the presence of the Almighty One in this place. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb who was slain that is standing in our midst today. Jesus, the risen, crucified, ascended Lord, is here in this place. Give him praise and glory. Shout to the rooftop. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Holy is his name. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. I haven't lost my senses. I know who I am, and I know whose I am. Yeah, I belong to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. I pray that everyone will come to the same knowledge of knowing Him and serving Him and calling the Father's name for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. Do we believe that, church? Do we believe that, church? I can't hear you, church. Do we believe it? Oh, Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, there's so much pain in our world. There's so much pain. I feel it inside of you, Lord. And you know what that pain is, Lord. It's dividing families, Lord. It's dividing societies, oh Lord. It's dividing countries, oh God. Oh Lord, may we be reconciliation ministers in our day and age, oh Lord. It's dividing the church, oh Lord. Oh, would you hear our cry for unity, Lord? Would you hear our cry for unity in this place and beyond, oh Lord? For all the people of God that have gathered from the rising of the sun, set a setting down of the same, may you bring unity upon the church. That we know what it means to call upon the name of the Lord day and night and night and day, Lord. And sing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain for us. Worthy is the Lamb. Lord, we pray today for what's going on in our world. We pray, O oh God, for the peace that is needed, O oh God. We pray for those suffering financially that don't know what their Christmas dinner is going to look like. Lord, may we be thankful for what we have, oh Lord, but may we also give to those that are in need, oh God. Give us eyes to see those that are in need, oh Lord. Spirit, awaken our hearts to listen to your voice and answer your voice. For how many times do we have to read in Scripture? He who has ears, let him hear what the Lord is saying or what the Spirit is saying. Lord, I want to hear you. I want to hear. Speak, O oh Lord. Speak to everyone in this room, from the youngest to the elder. Speak to us. We are in desperate need in church history right now to arise and take our positions and stand firm and stand united in the person of Jesus Christ for the sake of the world of God. Total help for total needs, O oh Lord, said one theologian. We need you, Lord. We need you not only for the things that are going bad, Lord, we need you even when the things are going right, because we can begin to think that we've done it all in our own strength. 
Oh, your gracious grace that is greater than all our sin. We give you praise and thanks for that, oh Lord. Lord, we lift up the families in our congregation and community that are still mourning. Still dealing with loss. Still waking up and going to a bedroom with the loved ones up there. Some of them were older, some of them were younger, but they're all sensing that 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 loss, O oh Lord, within their spirits. Would you minister to them? Would you embrace them with your presence, O oh God? May they know that Emmanuel is with us. And he hasn't ever left us. Lord, I pray for little Elliot this morning. Somebody that just came to life, a little baby, Lord, a little Lord of Newport. Lord, if they don't know if he's going to last or not last or live or not live, oh Lord, I pray a, a blessing and a healing, a full healing on this little child's name. Lord, that you would touch him, you would heal, and you would ignite faith in him, oh Lord, that he will serve you at a later date. Father, I lift up all those suffering from addictions in our Prince Edward Island, oh Lord. Every day we read about news and drug busts and this and about other people, oh Lord, suffering from addictions. We speak the name of Jesus over these addictions, oh Lord. We say you would break the chains of bondage and you have set the captives free once and for all. And Lord, I could be here till evening time listening to other addictions, but we lift them all up to you. And we stay united in Jesus and say, break those chains, oh Lord. Set the captives free. Lord, we pray for the food banks that are preparing to gather food. Well, how many baskets do we need? How many hampers? Well, we really don't know, oh Lord. But Lord, we're coming to the God who supplies our audience. And say, Lord, whatever we need for this year, you know I had a time. Would you provide it? All over the island, all over the nation, oh Lord. Lord, it broke my heart to read an article, oh Lord, that said somebody making a hundred thousand a year in Vancouver was kicked out of her apartment because she can't afford it. Lord, how much is this going to go in escalation? Lord, I pray, I pray, oh God, that you would give us wisdom in this age. Godly wisdom. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We come to you, oh Lord, and pray for wisdom, for guidance in all areas of our lives. I lift up our families to you, the families of this local congregation, oh Lord. Their extended families. I pray that this year, Lord, people will meet Jesus Christ in a real way. Amen. Not just a relative change, but a real change within the heart. Inside out change, Lord. Total transformation, oh God. Oh, Father, would you reveal yourself? This is not something we can do in our strength or on our own intelligence or working the Lord. We need the Spirit of the living God to move among us. Start the work in us. I pray for many more as she comes forward, that you would be upon her as she brings the story of Joseph once again to us. Lord, may we be clear of all the previous things that we thought about this episode, and may it bring something fresh and new to us, Lord. As the title gives, you are a gracious and merciful God. Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb. You are a gracious and merciful God. God, would you have your way this morning? you have your way. We're stepping back. We're stepping back. And we want you to take over. Come now, I pray in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, who was, who is, and is to come. And at this moment, he is right here. In his name we pray and all God's people said, Amen.
So let us stand for the reading of God's word, chapter 44, the book of Genesis, beginning at 14, ending at 34. Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house while he was still there, and they fell to the ground before him. Joseph said to them, What deed is this that you have done? Do you not know that one such as I can practice divination? And Judah said, What can we say to the Lord? What can we speak? How can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Here we are then, my Lord's slaves, both we and also the one in whose possession the cup has been found. But he said, Far be it from me that I should do so. Only the one in whose possession the cup was found shall be my slave. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. Then Judas stepped up to him and said, O oh my Lord, let your servant please speak a word in my Lord's ears, and do not be angry with your servant, for you are like the Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man and a young brother, the child of his old age. His brother is dead, and he alone is left out of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to his servants, Bring him down to me, so that I may set my eyes on him. He said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Then you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And when our father said, Go again, buy us a little food, we said, We cannot go down. Only if our youngest brother goes with us will we go down, for we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons, one left me. And I said, Surely he has been torn to pieces, and I have never seen him since. If you take this one also from me, and if harm comes to him, you will bring down my gray hairs and sorrow to Sheol. Now, therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then, as his life is bound up in the boy's life, when he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die, and your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant became surety for the boy to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I will bear the blame in the sight of my father all my life. Now, therefore... Please let your servant remain as a slave to my Lord in the place of the boy, and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the suffering that will come upon my father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we are in uh, that series. Many of you that are familiar and are part of our church, you know that. And uh, as I said, we will be doing this series for this Sunday and next, and then we move into our Advent uh, time of year. And uh, we have been looking at the fact that Joseph's life, an example of Joseph's life, but what we've also been looking at, more importantly, and we've said that the greatest hero of this book, and especially in the, as we're talking about the chapter and the chapters in Genesis, is God is indeed the hero. He is the one that has been faithful and is one that we can look to in times of need and concern. And so today we're looking at the fact that God meant it for good. And the chapters that you've heard, you heard only one chapter, but actually it's chapters 42, 43, and 44, and I had Pastor Mike just read a portion of that, because I don't know if you could handle hearing three chapters. And, and so as we look at the life of Joseph, there's an important question I want us to bring to the forefront today. Here's the question. Do people really change? Can people change? Yeah. Is it possible for people to change? I like this story. A woman testified to the transformation in her life that had resulted through her experience in Christ. She declared, I'm so glad I got religion. I have an uncle I used to hate so much. 
I vowed that I'd never go to his funeral. But now, why? I'd be happy to do it any time. <laughs> and so that's the question we're dealing with today. With We're talking about grace and mercy, and we're talking about the reality. Can people change? And so this is a time now, as we come into Joseph's story, that it's important that they face the past. See, God can do things in your life. There can be things that are going great in your life, but there comes a reckoning, there comes a point when you need to deal with your past. Joseph, with his brothers, he now will see how Joseph chose to interact with them as he has this encounter with them after, as like 20 years since he's seen them. But we also will witness the transformation in Judah. I love this statement. To be better and not bitter. Hmm. Does that one resonate with this? Say it to somebody. Be better and not bitter. Be better and not bitter. Look, so we come into the beginning of this. What game is Joseph playing? You know, you read these chapters, we grew up with the story, and we're saying, like, what game is he playing with his brothers? Is it out of resentment? Is it out of revenge? What's going on here as he plays with them? And the truth of it is we know it's not resentment or revenge because twice we're told he goes and weeps when he's around them. What Joseph is doing here is he's testing them. He's searching to see, have they truly changed, these brothers of mine? And so he puts them through these tests to discern their character. And so he shows them mercy and forgiveness. Have my brothers changed? Do people truly change? Or are they still the self-seeking, envious, greedy brothers that put me in such peril all those years ago? Are they still out looking for number one? And so as we look at this passage today, we back up and we kind of see the background in these early chapters here about these visits to Egypt. Now remember, we talked about the fact that there was a terrible famine coming. And now the famine is here, visit number one. So now the famine has hit even Canaan, not just Egypt. And Jacob tells his sons to go to Egypt to buy grain. I looked it up, it was actually 623 kilometers that they had to go. This is not just a trip around the corner to Foodland. This is 623 kilometers they would have to go to be able to buy grain. The famine now we know is so great. So 10 brothers go, but not Benjamin. The 10 brothers come and they bow down before Joseph and he treats them terribly and he spoke harshly to them, the scripture says. They're respectful of him, but they don't recognize him. Joseph knew who they were right away. And Joseph goes around accusing them of spies. What are you doing here? You must be some spies. And they said, oh, no, 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 sir. We're not spies. We're 12 sons of one man. And the youngest is with the father. And the other is no more. So ultimately, they're telling Joseph that they feel that he is dead, that he has died. Joseph puts them in prison for three days. Joseph releases them, but his one brother, Simeon, has to stay in jail. They could go back to the father, but the youngest would be the proof. They were to bring back the youngest, Benjamin, and he would be the proof that they weren't spies. While Simeon remains in prison. And so, notice the grace here. Because Joseph now sends them back to their families and to their father with big sacks of grain filled. And all the money that they paid for this grain is now returned to them and put in the top of their beds. And they're even given provisions for their journey. And so as they return and report it to Jacob what had happened, Simeon is in prison. And Jacob says, no, Benjamin's not going back. And so you look at this father, you look at this dysfunctionality in this family, you look at the problems, that poor Joseph experienced the problems, yes, because he was young and because he was arrogant, but because the father himself did things that put 
the children at odds with each other. We can't even comprehend that. That he decided it would be better to keep his blessed Benjamin home and let Simeon rot in prison. And so he refuses. Benjamin is not going back. No way. Well, now we see visit two because they've eaten up all their grain and now they're hungry. And we're talking now a whole clan of people. All of these sons have uh, wives and children and now it's a huge community that we're talking about. And so it becomes so severe, they begin to realize they have to go back to Egypt to buy more grain. But Judah, it's interesting here because now all of a sudden Judah has not been a leader up to this point. But Judah now stands forth as a leader and he begins to come and he says to the father, but God, I mean, but dad, we cannot go back. We told you that we cannot go back. We were told not to return unless we return with the youngest, with Benjamin. And so Jacob agrees that Benjamin can go with them. Judah takes personally the responsibility. You heard him tell uh, the story in the scripture that Pastor Mike read. Now Jacob decides at that point, send back, and they decide to do all the original money. They didn't spend it. They kept it. Because they knew it had to go back to Joseph. And so they kept that money. And they're going to return that money for the first visit. And now they're coming with more money for the second visit. But the one thing that Jacob thinks that might help a little bit and sweeten the deal. He tells them to go get some gifts for this man. Get him some balm and honey and gum and resin and pistachio nuts. Sat and had a few of them last night. Yum. And almonds. And he says, go send some gifts to them. And so with these gifts and the original money and the new money, they now and Benjamin, the second time they come and they stand before Joseph. But something strange happened. They were received graciously. That doesn't make sense. They were invited into Joseph's home. A meal was prepared for them. And now they're like, oh, we're surely doomed. He's getting us into his house. So now not just Simeon will be in prison, but we're all going to become his slaves. That must be what's going on here. And so they return the money to the steward of the house, and they say, some mistake must have been made. Here is the original money that was in our sack, and here's the new money to buy grain. And see, in that moment, they passed the test, one of them, because they were willing to sell their brother for 20 pieces of silver. But now in this moment, they're honest men when it comes to finances. Hello? They made sure that they returned that money that was found in their sack. And they come with money again. And so we can see in that moment that they're not the greedy young men they were. They're changed. They're honest men now. Simeon is now brought out of prison. And they brought their presence before Joseph in his house. And they bowed down before him. And we're told that seeing Benjamin, his real brother, the others are half brothers. This is his real brother, his baby brother, that he's not seen for decades. When he sees his baby brother, he has to excuse himself to weep. And as he pulls himself back together, he comes down and he sits at his table. And by the way, Egyptians could not sit with non-Egyptians. So he would be sitting at his table. They would be seated at another table. And then we're told that he sends portions from his table, the best of the best, down to their table. Here's the second test. As he sends the food down, he makes sure that Benjamin gets five times as much. Let's stir the pot a bit. Let's see how they respond to favoritism. Let's see if they get angry. Let's see, because remember now, these brothers were the ones who were upset because he was dad's favorite. They were upset because the father had given him what? A coat of many colors. Remember weeks ago we talked about that coat was a coat that would be worn by the person who would take that position when the father died. That's why they were angry. It wasn't the fact that it was a nice gift. It was the fact that it was a position of leadership as he went around wearing this coat. And so they're upset. They're angry. They're jealous. 
They're doing all of that. But somehow, at this table, their younger baby brother gets five times as much. And it doesn't seem like it even bothers them. Nothing is done. And so we see, once again, they passed another test. They're different. And then we're told that Joseph filled their sacks once again with provisions. And now double the money is put in the top of the sacks as they return home. But then there's the third test, the test of the silver cup. Let's see how they're going to react now. And so he tells his man and the steward of his house to make sure that they put all the money back on the sacks. But on that youngest one, make sure you put my silver cup in on top of it. And so they left. They're on their way back home to do the 623 kilometers home with the grain. That's why they needed provisions. And there they were going, not just a short distance away, when Joseph says to his steward and the men, go after them and catch them because they have stolen my silver cup. So they come and they stop these men. They're not far from Egypt when they stop them all and they say, you have stolen. Why did you do this terrible thing? You have stolen the silver cup of our master. Of course, they say, never would we do that. We're not thieves. We gave you the money for everything. We wouldn't steal anything from you. And then as they open up the bags, they find out it is Benjamin's sack that has the silver cup. What did they do? The word says they tore their clothes. What was that a sign of? You'll see that all throughout scripture. They tore their clothes. Many times tore clothes and put dirt on their heads, ashes on their heads. It was a sign of mourning. It was a sign of grief. And so as they find out that their baby brother is found to have the silver cup, they now all mourn and grieve. And they go before Pharaoh. They decide that hey, they're going to go with him back to Pharaoh's court. And whatever the consequences, they're going to go there with him in this situation. Joseph told them that he concluded that wherever the cup was found in that sack, that person would become his slave, and the rest of them were free to go home. But they wouldn't go home. They wouldn't leave this other son of Rachel. They decided to stay. And then we see that they fell before Joseph looking for mercy and grace, but Joseph can see that they're changed men. Then Judah approached Joseph. Now, I just thought that, that was very nervy to think that he could even come and have conversation with this man. And so he said, if we return without the boy, our father will surely die. And so all of a sudden, before, they didn't care about the father. They didn't care they were bringing home the coat with a lie, covered in blood, letting their father believe that their, his favorite son was dead. They didn't care about the father. In this moment, they're concerned for their father. And Judah especially steps forward, and he says, this will kill him for sure. And I gave my word that I would care for the boy. I'll see that he gets home to the father. So I'm asking you for mercy and grace. Let me take his place. Let me step in and take his place. Let him go back to my aging father, and I will become your slave. I will become your slave. In that moment, it's at that moment, we'll get into it next week, that Joseph now reveals who he is, because he has seen that his brothers have indeed Change. They are changed men. They are not the same men that put him in the pit all those years ago who sold him into slavery. They were remorseful for what they had done. We know that after the three days in prison, they're having a conversation amongst themselves, not realizing that Joseph could understand them. And they're talking about the fact, as Semites, they were talking about the fact that they were getting what they deserved. God was revengeful. God was giving them payback because of the terrible thing they had done to the brother who is no more all those years ago. When they find the money in the grain sacks, they're afraid that they'll be accused of stealing, and they make sure that money is returned. 
They're grieved over Benjamin. And we see that Judah approaches Joseph and is willing to sacrifice himself on behalf of his younger brother. Now, in all of that story today, Joseph had a choice. Joseph had a choice. Joseph had a choice to be gracious and merciful to his brothers. He sent home grain and provisions for them for their journey. He was concerned about them. He put the money back in the top of their bags as they returned after that first visit. This is not how you usually treat spies. <laughs> this is not how you usually treat prisoners. Here's the key. Before he even put the tests before them, he was gracious and merciful to them. It wasn't dependent upon how they were going to respond. He wanted to see, are my brothers truly changed? In order for him to grow in relationship with them and to do all the things that God wanted him to do. But he was gracious and merciful to these men who had treated him so poorly. It's a choice. Do you see that? It's a choice. And so God wants us, my friends, also to make that choice choice. He extended his love and care and compassion towards them when they didn't even deserve it. Sound familiar? They hadn't even asked yet for forgiveness. And so Joseph chose to be better, not bitter. And my friends, I want to tell you today, in this world, we have that same choice. I'll tell you, too, that a root of bitterness will destroy us. Bitterness will turn into anger. Anger will turn into hatred. Hatred turns into evil. And so we have a choice, just like Joseph had a choice, that he chose to be better and not bitter. We also have a choice to also be people who will be better than this, who will not stoop to that where other people have stooped to. Because we know who we serve. Now, we need to maybe, we sing about God's mercy. We sang this morning about God's grace. Sometimes we need to revisit, for us to truly understand what is mercy and grace, we need to just quickly have that explanation. Now, mercy, mercy is compassion or forbearance. I was praying this morning for long-suffering. Shown to lawbreakers or offenders. That's mercy. So here we are. We're coming into the court. Our rap sheet is long. We're doomed. We should be put away for life. But the judge has mercy on us. And we don't get what we deserve. That's mercy. Grace. Grace, on the other hand, is the unmerited favor of God. Like any good father wants to give gifts to his children, God is gracious towards us. I like what Max Lucado said in this quote. The difference between mercy and grace, mercy gave the prodigal son a second chance. Grace gave him a peace. And so our God is merciful and gracious towards us. And here in this moment, we see that Joseph is also very gracious and merciful to his brothers, though they do not deserve it. Now here's the key. I found this was the key. Joseph wanted to make sure not to make it too easy for his brothers. What does that mean? See, when we see this, we think it's done in anger. We think it's done in hatred and revenge and payback. But there's something here where Joseph realizes that even in that conversation they have after they get out of prison, that they are still living under the failure of what they did to their baby brother. They still have not gotten over it. They're still struggling with the fact they actually believe that God is revengeful and the things that they're going through is because of what they did in the past. And so they're still living under it. And so the point is here that Joseph is now an instrument of God bringing them through this place of transformation because you can only be transformed when you look at your past and you deal with it. You might be doing 
doing great right now. You might say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, everything is good in my life. But some of us, if we haven't dealt with it, the past is still there. Looming over us. Stealing our joy. Trying to keep us down and out. And the lies of the enemy began, what kind of Christian are you? Do you remember what you did? And so Joseph has forgiven them. Clearly he has, because he's merciful and gracious towards them. But the key is, have they forgiven themselves? And so there needs to be a place of remorse. There needs to be a place of confession. There needs to be a place of repenting of our past, of those things. And you know, sometimes we can make it too easy for people to come into faith. Say the little magical prayer, and you're on your way to heaven, hallelujah. And they've not come through the vehicle of confession. They have not come through the vehicle of true repentance for what they've done, the sins that they have caused. And therefore, they are never changed and transformed. They are never set free from those things. God is wanting us today to understand the power of confession, to understand the power of repentance, to understand to be remorseful for our past, but then hallelujah to be set free from it once and for all. And when Satan tries to bring it up, I say it's under the blood. Hallelujah. Get away from me. Get behind me, Satan. And so we see that he realizes that they need to come to a place and they recognize they're long overdue for punishment. They, as he comes, they come three times before Joseph. And then they realize they have to confess their hard-heartedness and then they need to confess that they shed blood. And Joseph chose to forgive. That was a choice. We too must bring a full admission of our guilt to God. Of our sin. Now, some people won't even use that term sin, but I want to say to you today, I've talked to a lot of people that are on church people, and I'll say, Do you have any regrets? Thoughts. Whatever term you want to use. <laughs> when we look back, and I look at my life, and I think, I wish I didn't, I couldn't, I, I will you know. There's those things that we need to just come before Christ and, and just plead the blood of Christ over. I love what 1 John 1 9 tells us. It is not the norm for us now as believers, but he does say something very powerful. Listen to this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us all from all unrighteousness. Notice the key at the beginning of that verse. If we confess. That's where it starts. And I praise God today for his grace and his mercy. But just as confession is necessary to restore us to a right relationship with God, we too must practice forgiveness, mercy, and grace towards others who have caused us terrible harm. See, some of us have no problem believing and receiving God's grace and mercy, but you want me to do what, Pastor? Do you know what they did? Let me tell you what they did. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You're supposed to choose to be merciful and gracious to them because you haven't been a recipient of God's grace. Now you are called to be gracious to everyone you meet. Jesus would say it even further. Jesus would say even love your enemies. Don't see too many people saying that is about very usually. We see here today, once again in this story, Prolifically is putting forward to the day when Jesus would come and fulfill this so much more than Joseph and Judah. But when Joseph demanded that the brothers return home to Jacob without Benjamin, Judah emerges as now the leader, the new spokesperson for the family. What gave Judah the right? Remember now, he is the person who broke the faith of the family by marrying a Canaanite. Here's his past. He raised such wicked sons that the Lord put two of them to death. <clears throat> he treated his daughter-in-law as a prostitute. 
and he had hatched, he was the planner that made the plan to sell his own brother a slave. You realize that? This is that uh, thing happening here now between Judah and Joseph. It was Judah's idea, by the way. Has he changed? But praise God for God's transformation in any man or woman. Because Judah showed Joseph he was a changed man. He exhibited unexpected compassion in telling about the family's heart-wrenching experience of starvation, of his father's undying love for Benjamin, that Judah's own promise to his father that he had to bring Benjamin back home, lest Jacob literally die from grief. And then in an ultimate expression of compassion, Judah offers himself as a substitute for Benjamin. We see the ultimate sacrifice. Judah is now a changed man. My friends, God is in the business of changing and transforming people. Amen. I pray you know this transformation. Now, haven't arrived yet, and probably you haven't either. <laughs> but praise God, he is transforming me. And so Judah ultimately points to Jesus' sacrifice, doesn't he? He was willing to give up his life for his baby brother. Only the irresistible work of the Holy Spirit can explain such a transformation in such a man's life. It took him years to get there. It doesn't happen overnight. But the Spirit's sanctifying work is changing and transforming us. And it brings profound results that our family can't even recognize us anymore. I pray that's the truth. And there's one greater than Judah. Jesus Christ gave up his life for our sake. He sacrificed himself for all of humanity once and for all to give us a new life, to give us glory, to change and transform us. And he said in Matthew's gospel, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And we see that not just Judah points to Jesus in these chapters, but Joseph points to Jesus. We see Judah points to sacrifice. Well, now Joseph uh, points to God's provision. Joseph had the opportunity for payback. He had the opportunity to make them pay for what they did to him. Instead, he chose to provide for them, to forgive them, to be gracious and merciful. He says to them, God sent me ahead of you. And as we've been doing in our series, you might have meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You can only say that if you have forgiven. You realize that? You can only come to that conclusion if you have forgiven. Jesus could have made us all pay, my friends. He could have called 10,000 angels and left that cross and say, it's not worth it. Let them die in their sins. But instead, he chose to forgive us. He chose, made that choice to be merciful and gracious to sinners like us. And so we have been recipients of his grace and mercy. I want to challenge you today as we bring this to a close. You are called to sacrificial living. If you are in Christ, you are called to sacrificial living. You are called to be a substitute for others. You are called to stand in the gap when others can't. You are called to be that example of Christ when no one else will at school or at the workplace. You are called, just like Judah was willing to be that ultimate a sacrifice for his baby brother. We too need to be that kind of person. And we need, if we're not there, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to continue to do his changing and transforming work in us. Amen. We also have a choice today to choose to forgive. And my suspicion is if you've been through anything like I've been through, this life will throw things at us. It'll be so easy for them to stick. Oh, in one side of our mouth, we're praising the Lord and we love the Lord. But there's a divided heart because something is stuck. And something is...
feeling we've not been able to let go. And something is still holding on to us. And my friends, it's going to hold you down and hold you out. And if you're not careful, you will one day wake up far from God. And I've seen so many in, in pastoring a church over the years. The enemy has got a hold of them because they will not forgive. It's a choice. Now, am I saying your feelings are going to be there? No. <laughs> I'm saying we're not going by feelings. We walk by faith, not by sight. It means that I come to a place that I know that I know that I know with God's help, I need to forgive that person, and I'm making that choice today, and God is going to help me to do it. And that's what we're asked to do. To be gracious to people who don't deserve it. To be merciful to people who don't deserve us. How many times can I forgive my brother? <laughs> Should I forgive my brother? See, Peter was wanting to come and make a list and say, okay, I've done enough. He wanted Jesus to say, oh, you've, been, you've done enough, Peter. <laughs> so you see, we want to feel that somehow we're right. Everyone else is wrong and we've done enough. And yet we have to look in the eyes of our Savior nailed to that tree when he looked down across the crowd and said, Father, forgive me. For they do not know what they do. And I believe, my friends, with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is possible. Right. Someone said that unforgiveness is the poison meant for the other that you drink yourself. And ultimately, it will destroy you. And through all of this, there is one constant. God is faithful. God remains the same. God's promises are true. God is gracious and merciful towards us. Can people change? Yes. Did you hear that? Can people change? Yes. Can people change? Yes. Can those, those addicted today be set free from addictions? Yes. Can the person who's bitter and angry and unforgiving be a person that's loving, kind, compassionate? Yes. That's what this place is about. It's about change and transformation. It is a place of hope. It's a place where we get on our knees and we pray for our family members and our colleagues and our neighbors because we believe in the power of God's grace to change and transform people. <laughs> do we believe that, church? I hope we do. I hope we pray that way. I hope we talk that way. And how do we know it? Just look at our lives. <laughs> Just look at us. We're the examples of it. We're the examples that know that we have and it is possible to change, that God is in the business of transforming. And I want you to look to somebody and say, God isn't finished with me yet. He's not finished with us yet. We haven't arrived. None of us arrived. He's still working on me. He's still working on you. And we're going to be gracious towards each other. Because he is working on us. This should be a house of grace. A house of mercy. A house of the second chance, third chance, fifth chance, a hundred chances. Amen. Because this is his house, not mine. It's a house of grace and mercy. I choose to forgive you. No matter what you do, no matter what you say. Of course it's disappointing. But I choose to forgive. Because my eternal destiny is not worth the energy it's going to take to be angry and bitter all my life against someone who hurt me. Right. Right? As the worship band comes, I have a story to end with. I think we said enough. <laughs> I didn't know this gentleman, but I, I, read, I heard this story and I looked it up and I found it quite in interesting. Now some of you would have to be older quite older to know who this was, but it's a great story. There was a well-known radio host, comedian, songwriter in Hollywood. This was back in the 1950s, and his name was Stuart Hamlin, and he was noted for his drinking, womanizing, and partying. <laughs> and one day along came a young preacher holding a tent revival, and Hamlin had him on his radio show, presumably to poke fun at him. And in order to gather more material for his show, Hamlin showed up at one of the revival meetings. Early in the service, the preacher got up and he said, there is one man in this audience who is a big faith. Now, there were quite a few in the audience that felt it was them, but Hamlin was convinced that the preacher, have you ever noticed how that happens? Hamlin was convinced that the preacher was preaching about him. 
And some would call it conviction, but he would have nothing to do with it. Still, the words continued to haunt him for the next couple of nights. Later, he showed up drunk at the preacher's hotel room at 2 a.m. in the morning, demanding that the preacher pray for him. And the preacher wisely refused, saying, this is between you and God. And I'm not going to get in the middle of it. However, he invited Stuart in, and they talked till 5 a.m. in the morning. I would think that by that time he began to sober up. At which point Stuart dropped to his knees and with tears cried out to God, That is not the end of the story, praise God. Stuart quit drinking, he quit chasing women, hallelujah, and he quit everything, you see. Soon he began to lose favor with Hollywood. He ultimately was fired by the radio station when he refused to accept a beer company as a sponsor. Hard times were upon him. He tried writing a couple Christian songs, but the only one that had much success was This Old House, written for his friend Rosemary Clooney. As he continued to struggle, a longtime friend came, John, took him aside and told him, all your troubles started when you got religion. Was it worth it? Stewart answered simply, yes. Then his friend asked, you like your booze so much, don't you ever miss it? His answer was, no. John then said, I don't understand how you can give it up so easily. Stewart's response was, it's no big secret. All things are possible to God. To this, John said, that's a catchy phrase. You should write a song about it. And as they say, the rest is history. The song that Stuart wrote was, It is no secret. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll welcome you. It is no secret what God can do. Amen. A changed life. By the way, his friend was John Wayne that was asking those questions. And the young preacher who refused to pray for him was the late Billy Graham. My friends, today we believe that anyone can change with God's transforming grace, God's transforming power. I pray today that you've done the hard work where you've actually looked at your life and looked at your sin and realized the pain that has cost others and the pain that has cost God. And you've been remorseful and you have confessed it and you have repented of it, and you have been set free of it. That is what the gospel is about. Praise God, I've got a ticket to heaven, hallelujah. But I can be changed and transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to challenge you, church, today. You have a choice. You can be better, or you can be bitter. Let's sing this song in closing. And if you need to do business with God, if you need to come to a place of confession and repentance, you need to nail it down. You need to nail it to the cross and say, I know that I know that I know my past is paid for. Hallelujah. See, he already forgave you. When Christ died on the cross, he forgave everyone once and for all. His price, the price has been paid. We don't go back. Christ doesn't get crucified over and over and over again. He paid the price. When he was on that cross, he didn't just say, Father, forgive him. He also said that victory cry, it is finished. The price has been paid for all sins once and for all. But we have to come and confess. We need to come in conviction and remorse for our sins. We need to repent of our past. And we need to receive that forgiveness as a precious, wonderful gift, what Christ has done for us. And my friends, it's like you crucify him all over again if you don't live in the power of his mercy and grace and exercise mercy and grace towards us. We're going to sing this song. If you need to do business with God today, I encourage you to come. We would love to pray with you. If you don't want to walk up the middle, you can walk up the sides. But I believe we're in God's house today, we do business today. And there are those that need to be set free from a root of bitterness and unforgiveness. There are those that need to know that it's been nailed to the tree once and for all. And I am free, hallelujah, of my past. Let's pray.
Father, we come to you today. We now surrender this moment. This call that is coming forward is coming from you, Holy Spirit. You have been speaking. You have been calling. You were already in the middle of the service before we even got to the preaching of your word. And people have a choice today. They can choose to go home and say, wasn't that nice? And there are some that need to choose today. You know what? I'm not going home till I do business with God today. And I need his transforming work in my life. I need to know that my past has once and for all been nailed and forgiven and done with. And some of us have picked up this root of bitterness that we now need to make the choice with the power of the Holy Spirit to say, I am not carrying this anymore. I am choosing to forgive. Now, God, help me to walk in that. And so, Lord, we pray now in this moment that you would help us and guide us in Jesus' name.
Judah would become the tribe that would hold the scepter, that King David would come from. And not just the scepter of King David, but the actual Messiah himself would come from the line of Judah. Not from Joseph, not from the other brothers, but God chose to use Judah and his clan and his tribe for future generations to come. It would now become the kingly tribe where the king and the king of kings would eventually come. I want to read as our benediction today as you go from Revelation when it talks about that. And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and his seven seals. That's the kind of transformation that God can do in the person's life. That generations to come will be blessed because we have been obedient to what God is doing and calling us. May you be encouraged today. God bless you as you go.